Hi everybody, I'm Andy and welcome to LE Publishing's webinar today on activities to develop language and skills using graded readers and uh, this slide will appear at the end with my email details and the contact details for my international colleagues at, uh, at LE and uh, I absolutely love talking about readers. I travel quite a lot around the world to meet different teachers in different schools and institutions in many different cultures and mindsets about the way we use reading in the classroom, graded reading in particular. And today's webinar I want to really focus on the activities that would engage our readers of, of different ages, particularly the secondary students where we feel teenagers they don't like reading or we, we've made them perhaps feel that reading is boring and we'll come to that and also to focus on communication really. So I'm not going to do a webinar on lots of grammar activities and lots of vocabulary activities but there will be language in there. I mean if grammar and vocabulary are part of our skills they are they are skilled. The skills are nothing without the grammar and vocabulary. We'll see that graded reading on a regular basis without too much testing uh, is the way to go and uh, there was a previous webinar I, I gave on this on uh, extensive reading and and the argument that if we are bringing more graded reading into the classroom, allowing time for it, despite what we think at the moment, then by easy reading, and I mean below their level, the students can pick and choose their own books, their own level, and then miraculously the, the students will actually absorb and consolidate the language you've been trying so hard to teach through course books. So readers really sit alongside course books in my opinion and in the opinion of many out there who found results come from using graded readers, letting the students choose uh, by topic and level and then communicate from there. In other words, if the text is easy and the stories are enjoyable and easy for all ages, then they can do the tasks, right? If you've got a difficult story or a difficult chapter, nobody understands it or only the, the clever ones have got it, then how can you do the activities if they're already challenged with the language? So my first point is really to get the students, if sometimes they're reading the same book together, that's fine, but let it be a level below their normal uh, level so that really the challenge is not to understand everything and learn new language but to revise what you've done, enjoy it in a story and I emphasize that that is also essential for teenagers, not stories for kids, stories are for everybody and then communicate from there, respond to the story. I mean don't we really want to respond to the things we read, to teach our students to, re to, to respond to what we read? And I just want to recap from a previous webinar and invite you to just look again at the need for choice in the classroom about reading. You may not feel at this point that there is time, but only because maybe you've never thought about the benefits of making time for graded reading. Um, and to know that really this is an obvious but very popular diagram you see in articles on English language teaching about reading easily and the benefits of easy reading, not difficult challenging reading which is always what we get in textbooks. And that has its place of course but that's not really the end of the story because you have to move on next week or next lesson to another grammar point or vocabulary uh, list but where is that recycling? It's not going to happen in the progress uh, revision units, not really because it still feels like they're being tested and working with a course book. So readers allow this circulation of easy reading to produce confidence and motivation. They understand more easily and then they'll finish the books which is, you know, let's remember that the readers are only short books. You don't have to make them read long things but they might in the end choose them if they can finish and not stop all the time to, to look up words. So if they read you know, easily and they, they, they're going to they're gonna understand more, they're going to enjoy it and they will read faster. And fluency, remember, is not just for advanced learners. People often think fluency, he's fluent in Italian or he's fluent in German. We know that the implication there is speaking and that is difficult to speak fluently but you can read fluently if you know enough and the text is graded for you and that's why it's vital that the students have mixed ability uh, issues addressed by letting them choose their own books according to what they like and the level they are at. It's, it, it's motivating and it does build confidence and it absolutely boosts language acquisition. Not, not miraculously learning new words but 
maybe guessing some out of context because a story is a context uh, and by consolidating the things that they've learned. You need to see new language or a word maybe 15 or 20 times close together in a time period for that to really stay in the long-term memory and we know that there's no time or space for that in course book teaching. You learn a new word, you go home with a vocab list, there's a test on Monday and we know that really is very very difficult to, to, to see as a a motivating but also an effective teaching and learning practice. And reading is its own reward, remember. Uh, we would say that, you know, the reason we read is for pleasure, for information, and uh, to really make us smarter. People who read a lot are smart and um, we want the students to feel that reading is something that they uh, can do for the rest of their lives. It's not just something for a test or to learn language. Um, we want them to know that reading can be easy, can be chosen. We can give up on books we don't like. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's teach them that. And then, of course, rather than seeing English as or a text is just for a, an exercise or a comprehension task, it's something that they can learn, enjoy, and hopefully leave school believing that English and reading are more than something for school. And we can do that. And this is how you do it. You get them to to really, you know, enjoy choice uh, by topic and level of the books that you give them. And in fact, we're talking, yes, quite literally, a small mini library of maybe 50 to 100 books for any class to look at. And uh, ideas on setting up a program like that are in the previous webinar, and I'll give you some links now. But actually, if you do this, if you give them more books to read, and time to read, knowing that they will finally be allowed to read things that they like and understand, not p not pushed to read something at the same level, the same topic, the same one-size-fits-all approach. It feels like the thing we do at school, but there's no evidence to say that that works. And actually, our teacher's instinct tells us that that's not working, and this is how we should supplement and support the learning. Now, just a quick reminder uh, of why readers are so important. Take a look at this text from uh, Gulliver's Travels, I think that is. Don't have to read it now, but you can see it's a regular piece of prose from a graded uh, story, adapted classic fiction in this case. And this is what readers do. If you didn't already know about this, this is one of the reasons, or the essential reason, why readers exist. Not just to make stories simple, but to repeat language. Look at the frequency there of the past simple of to be. Was, 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 wasn't. Look how many times in any story you're going to see the past simple. And how do they really learn the past simple? Usually it's a rule in unit five of a book and then it's a list of irregular verbs. I mean that's that's mechanical and academic but we need this. We need to see it. They need to see repeated language. Storm, ship, uh, swim and swam, look at that. Um, and when you look at graded readers, find some and flick through them and you'll see by nature of a graded story, graded means limited use of language to help them understand. That means you have to repeat the language. And of course the students would love that. Think about what it's like to learn a language and how glad we are to see the same word that you've learned and it comes back and, and again and you think, oh I know that one, I don't have to struggle. Because the mind is thinking, especially your students, they're going to be thinking, oh this is going to be hard, this is reading. Uh, and no, let them learn that there are some times when the, the text will be difficult and sometimes the text can be easy. Because what we're doing here is not teaching and testing, we're letting them revise and practice with language that they know. So look at that, that's what readers do. They, they, they provide frequent exposure to the language they've done. And yeah, every now and again, if you can, I mean ideally if a reader has only three to five difficult words on any page, depending on the student's level, because everybody's different, then that's the way to go. Not too easy, not too hard, but just enough of a challenge. And those words that they don't know, well, they might just look them up because there aren't so many on the page, or they can move on because this is not just for testing. Or they could guess from the context. So Google extensive reading. Reading lots of longer text, but easily below your level for fluency and to consolidate language and have frequent input. And uh, the best website I, I know uh, among many, so do look at different websites on extensive reading, ER Central, and those uh, resources there are free ideas on how and why 
you know, extensive reading benefits our students in the English language learning class or any language teaching class, how much they should read, the sort of questions that teachers will have if you're not doing this already. Example ER programs, how do I set up a little library? How do I know they're reading? You know, these things are all covered by many teachers who've gone before us all for the last 30 years or more. And uh, there are obstacles as to why many teachers know this but don't do it. But those obstacles are usually, you know, surmountable money, uh, time, understanding. You know, if you work together as a team, get to know it and try it out on a few classes for a year, you can soon see that those students will get results. Early readers uh, are the topic of today's well, source material and if you go to the LE graded readers website you can download a free guide on using readers all about how to uh, build a program and you know activities which we're going to look at today drama pre-reading after reading and uh, a really good generic guide on any title so it's not a title by title guide it's a series of general highly practical activities for all ages and levels and that's free on the LE graded readers dot com website. Now I think you know look at this picture here this is a nice collection of covers I picked them randomly and you can see already that really th there's already going to be a preference if I was standing in front of a conference group or a workshop like I, I like to do I would show them and, and quickly in a couple of minutes ask each of you in pairs or groups to decide which one you'd like to do with me if we had if we had time to work together for a, a, a term or a, or a week and of course opinions vary because we all like different things and that's why we should choose easy short books to do in class or even for homework so we can get through more because you know you can't please them all one student just might not like it and then at least they know in this class it's easy reading and we're doing activities that are going to be similar to course book activities but more because we want communication from these uh, from the from the stories responding to what's happening in the themes and the characters and it's important we know you know that they know that there's going to be a choice of, of different topics and uh, they can you know swap books and talk about different genres and one of the first activities you can do at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the summer term before they go into the holiday break is to establish from the class what are the genres that you have in fiction you know or even just ask them about films let's not spook them about stories especially teenagers if they think they're going to be doing more reading they haven't yet learned from you maybe that you're going to be doing reading in a very different way you're going to be giving them easy things to read because we're not testing them anymore we want them to respond to the stories and whilst they're reading we know that there's a consolidation effect by frequent regular comprehensible input and you could brainstorm these topics from the students in an activity you could do um, you could put up those covers for example around the classroom you can go to the catalog which I'll show you in a second take out the pictures put them on the screen or around the room as little pictures and then the students can go around guessing what the genre is discussing it you can do it in the first language I mean I personally don't believe it's fair or even effective to make the students only speak English in every second of every class. That's my opinion. Opinions can vary. But I remember as an adult and a child what it was like to be in a language uh, classroom and it's hard and it's can be, it can be too stressful. It's like being underwater and you need to come up for air. Um, so from my perspective you, you have my permission to let them speak in their own language because this is not about a test of English knowledge. This is getting them activated with the, the topics and themes and then I can bring them back into English only. That's when the task is really for a, an English say communication outcome but here I want them to be talking about what they can see everything gets you know gets uh, kicked around the classroom and I don't care what language they do it in because you're the teacher and you can bring it back in good time so brainstorm the themes and then do a survey find out what your class likes they can do their own handwritten surveys or they can go to things like survey monkey they'll you might not know this but uh, it's easy to do and the students would certainly be able to figure it out and teach you and they can go back to that list and then do a class survey or a, a survey for the whole year or, you know or their, their family and the surveys to be done to generate and activate their knowledge about genres but crucially you can use that survey to find out what they like because imagine you, you've decided to do I don't know Dracula for the whole year and nobody likes Dracula why would you do it and if it's in the exam well 
okay, we've got no choice, but you can put other books in around Dracula to support that. So it's crucial to know what they want. Ask them what they'd like to read. Ask them to pick covers uh, as a sort of activity and then look at the blurbs in the catalogues and uh, make that an activity. So there's the catalogue. You can download a free uh, PDF from the LE Graded Readers website. And um, as you can see, you know, like any catalogue, you can go and find covers. You can make a, your own selection and pick different genres so that students see that wide range, okay, like this one. And then ask them to talk more about uh, maybe particular titles you'd like to do with them, but you pick a wide enough range from the catalogue to see which ones really they they all hate because if you hated uh, one title all of you why would you do it you know and some teachers say oh no I love to do Pride and Prejudice it's my favorite book I love Jane Austen well yeah I know but have they chosen that with you could you give them something that they'd enjoy and there's there's plenty of time to to love Jane Austen even if you do but let's focus for this part of our English language teaching on things that they've chosen and for once they can have a choice right they never get a choice about things to do do they here's an opportunity so you pick the covers and maybe pick the book blurbs what I've done here is I've just taken uh, let's say from one of these catalogues uh, pages you know the, the kind of blurb that you see and I think I adapted it a little bit and there you can read three quick summaries of uh, three different stories have a little look and um, what you'd have to do there you would tell the students maybe you would pick three blurbs or maybe you would do six depending on your level and age of the classroom or make the sentences shorter make it just a one-line blurb um, and then ask them with a handout or pictures on the wall to go around and match the blurb with the cover and that's kind of a simple thing it can take a while but you can get quite a lot out of that. You can start to elicit language that you want them to use and learn when talking about books or particular books. Um, you could do a similar thing where you've got one book that you're doing. All the different illustrations from that one book that you have, you can take pictures or download the ebook, which I can do later. You get a code in the cover of Ellie's Readers and you can put that into an app um, or go to Ellie online.com and, and check that out and then you can put the pictures on the whiteboard and or you know whatever but let them work with the blurb and then they're starting to get to know about summarizing stories and that's an activity that we can do later when they know the stories themselves but for here they're just matching with you know the uh, the, the covers speaking of covers another good and simple way to get students engaged we want them to we don't want to open this book, The 39 Steps, which if you haven't read is a great famous classic spy novel. It's great and it's been filmed a number of times. But we don't want to go, oh guys, today read, we're doing reading, chapter one, okay, open your books, let's start reading. Blah, it's like jumping into a cold swimming pool and nobody wants that. So you hold up the cover or put up the picture and ask the students, you know, in, for a minute, just one minute, okay guys, in English or in your first language, I, like I said I don't mind I'm not testing them at this point I want them interested that's my goal here the activity is interest what's gonna happen here what who is he what's he doing what what's that car that looks like an old car is it modern is this a book set in modern times how much can you get out of the class from just the cover the 39 steps what do they think that title could be is it a building uh, is it a, a journey which has 39 steps at some point um, it's there's a lot not all covers work but certainly worth looking at the cover what can I elicit from the class and then of course as you listen maybe English words or the first language words you put them on the board because if you've read the book before they have which I recommend uh, then you know the kind of language you'd like to hear from them to get ready for what they're going to read in other words I'm not putting them into a story uh, as a big surprise for language I want them into the story to understand it and enjoy it not to be challenged too much by the language remember graded readers are really to be used to consolidate and practice what they already know and yeah sometimes it's great and necessary to use one reader together as a class reader maybe just five minutes in every lesson to open your books and read together um, but 
we want them not to feel like, oh, this book is so hard, I hate it. No, this book is really easy to understand. And if they don't like it, I want it to be because the story doesn't suit that child or learner, not because they didn't understand it. Um, okay. Or find a picture in the book. I mean, that's a great picture, isn't it? Look at that. Imagine you come into your classroom and your teacher has put this up on the... As they're walking in and they're settling down and you've got something ready and you know, they know that you've you've thought of something for them. They're not waiting for that, you know, whatever start you sometimes do that might not always work. They're looking at a picture and they're thinking, right, as soon as this lesson starts, we're going to find out about this guy. Why is he hanging there? What's at the bottom? Oh, it's a car. He crashed, but is he going to die? You know... That now, I mean, that really could be how you introduce them to your new book. Instead of showing the cover, you might start with this picture. And then, wow, they're going to wonder, how did this happen? Right, we're going to listen to the teacher. We're going to read this, find out. And when they realize from chapter one, it's easy to, to understand, that's great because they're not suddenly demotivated. Having started with a great picture, now you've lost them because the language was too high. Um, because remember we're repeating language was was went fell he was holding he and you'll see again and again graded readers serve this purpose there's another one same same story the 39 steps you, what questions could you ask the, the, the students what what things would they say when they saw this picture what's going to happen next what happened uh, and where, where does he go next and why is he on the run is it you know gave it away there he's on the run hey that's quite good tell them that and then they go oh really why curiosity isn't that the best tool we've got with our students using their curiosity and if you're thinking teenagers don't like reading aren't they the most curious of all now when we look at text uh, an activity that is very popular out there we've known this for a while but you can do this with readers look at the text um, this actually goes with this picture okay if you quickly scan down um, to just a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit halfway, it says the train moved off again. I hoped that they would start to look for me there, and I think uh, and think that I was going north. Right now, I needed to get off the train, but not at a station. I needed to get off between stations. Suddenly, the train stopped. Blah blah. Okay, now you could actually take that text and chop it up. You know, the night before, make some copies of that page make out little pieces now you know what a jigsaw task is uh, all I'm saying is use it with these readers you know and maybe get them to sort of warm up on that text by looking at it um, and, and moving it into the right order and then they can talk about you know their, their different solutions um, now this briefly reminds me just to stop a second and and talk about reading out loud um, the reason I mentioned the jigsaw task is this is how I would approach reading out loud if you feel you must do reading out loud with the students and by that I mean when you want them to read out loud because I don't think it's really great reading out loud and a lot of people are, would agree with me uh, many don't but I don't think it's a real-life task I mean think about it when when do students need after school I mean like in in the real world when do we read out loud who does that teachers uh, religious leaders politicians so unless our students are definitely going to be one of those three, have I left anything out? This isn't really a very meaningful real task, is it? Making the students read out loud is something we do at school, but have we ever really thought about if that's helpful? Is it really helping them? I, I think I know what you're going to say next, but I'll come to that. But make no mistake, and I know the primary ones, the kids love it. Most of the kids, primary, they love reading out loud, some more than others, and that's great let's let's harness that let's use that that's great and let's remember also there could be some kids in that class primary who really don't like reading out loud in spite of the the general majority of, of enthusiasm there but in secondary mm, that's different think about it when you choose kids one by one your young young adults to read out loud in front of everybody else I would say and I know this as a fact most of them feel under pressure, self-conscious and embarrassed and I was like that and I was quite keen at one point <laughs> so I hated it I had butterflies when they had to read out loud didn't like it and yes there could be teachers there are usually in my conferences and workshops who say oh Andy my, my students love reading out loud and I go well yeah how many do they all like it or 
Are you thinking of a few that always put up their hand? Anyway, we can assume that not everybody feels comfortable reading out loud, and it's not a real-life task. And are they really paying attention? If an activity is reading out loud, well, let's think about it. You've got a student, you say, OK, um, Mary, you read that line now. So Mary feels under pressure, right? She's thinking, oh, no. Uh, and then what are the other students doing? Are they really listening to Mary? Well, yes and no. They're either not listening because they're thinking, ha ha, Mary's doing the reading. I can now play over here and twiddle my hair and, you know, talk to my friend. So you lose the attention. It's not an interesting class, is it, when Mary's reading and there's 27 other kids not listening. And even, even if they are listening, I think the ones who are listening are only doing so because they're terrified that they are next. And that means they're not really listening to Mary. They're skipping down below her reading to see if if they can prepare the next bit. But that's, isn't that interesting? Because I know that I'm right. Because you, you you're nodding. I think you're nodding. They are waiting to see if they're next. Because they're scared, which is not a feeling I really want in the classroom, and you don't want. But it tells me that, no, they're not listening. But yes, they are preparing. That tells me they want to prepare. So why don't we? It's also a false sense of control. I think teachers generally like reading out loud because it keeps the class under control. But it's not. It's like keeping a lid on a on something boiling. That, no, that's pressure. So if Mary's reading and then, you know, David over here, he's he's messing about. He's talking because Mary's reading and he's not paying attention. What do you do next? Yeah, you stop her and they say, David, uh, David, you start reading. And now David's lost, and now they're laughing and they're nudging him. So you've kind of lost control anyway. David may find his place to start reading. Mary's not listening because she's not. She's it's over. You know her her pain and suffering has gone, right? So she's never going to listen to what David reads. David just wants the whole thing over. No one else is listening, and so on. And and you know using it using reading to control the class like you read, stop, you shush, stop, you read now. <laughs> That's all for me really negative. It's not a great feeling in the class. You get stressed. And anyway, when one person is reading out loud, that is no one else is doing anything. And I think we need to be involving our students much more. And I'll come to solu the solution in a moment. But it isn't really helping with their pronunciation. Because I think if you're thinking, well, Andy, this is the only speaking practice they get, then we need to think about more time and opportunities for real speaking activities, which we can do today even. Um, but it's not not helping their pronunciation because think about it are you really at your best when 25 or 30 other kids are listening to you if they are listening making you feel nervous you're speaking out loud from a text you've never looked at before I mean all those things are just not helpful and so it's not going to be your learners best pronunciation um, you could do other things which I'll come to but that's not their best pronunciation if, imagine if someone gave you a text in a foreign language, which is quite challenging, in front of all, the, all your peers and said, read out loud. It's No, I don't think it's, it's great. Uh, why don't you pre prepare a way through the whole year on a, to be on a one-to-one -one basis? So if you are doing a reader together in the classroom or other homework or uh, writing work, for example, when everybody's busy, you could go around the class one by one, not in one lesson but over many lessons and do one-to-one -one with uh, the students and then you'll you'll really see and hear what they can and can't do because you're going to have to or want to correct them a little bit and I'd rather any kind of student they would rather that you 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 gave them some feedback one-to-one -one than out loud in front of all their friends and if you're still pushing back on me here and thinking mm, Andy I don't know that's an interesting list but you know, this is what I do at school. Well, examine it. This is an opportunity, you know, this isn't just a webinar to talk about readers. This is These are sessions where we can stop and think about whether what we do works and if we can offer an alternative. And I'm saying let's do an alternative. And one alternative, if I go back to those texts, is instead of making the students read out loud one by one each paragraph and, and having all the problems and negativity that goes with the list that I've just shown you, chop it up into the jigsaw task and then um, ask the students to work in groups that could be a group of three or four with that first paragraph or a second one. So break up the paragraphs into a decent number of groups of say three, 
students, two to three students, and then say, right guys, we're going to do some reading out loud practice, but hey, you know, things are different around here now. You can do it together in groups. You're going to get like five minutes to prepare, you know, and put some drama into it, make it more fun, and um, maybe give prizes for the ones who gave the most dramatic reading. Yeah, it could be two or three students reading out loud in like a chorus, but that's very supportive, and then you can pick them out. Look, that, this is just a solution if you agree that these are the things that are in my opinion, and I would say in many others' opinion, just not uh, an ideal scenario when we ask students to read out loud. And if you think about it, it's not really something we do a lot in real life. And I do a lot of speaking out loud in front of audiences. And if somebody gave me a text to read out loud, I would want to see it first. So let that be the, the main message uh, on that one. So you, you could be saving some students from hating lessons just because of this, because I did. <laughs> So using covers is a good way to get students interested. There's Treasure Island, okay. So they could look at that picture, what do they know? They probably know that book, so picking titles um, that they know from films would be great, because then, if they know the story already a little bit, then that's great. I don't necessarily expect every story to be a surprise. You know, I can think of things I've seen on TV when I was studying German, and I lived in Germany. Um, I didn't have readers or or books of films in those days but I remember watching lots of corny spy films crime films and a lot of the language was known to me only because it was there somewhere for me um, I wasn't fluent in German at that point but I knew the narratives in some t some cases I knew the films really well so I would be able to predict what they were saying or work out what they're saying so Treasure Island for example is a good a good title to use with students to um, to let them see in English what they know already is happening, if it's the right level. If it's not, not the right book, okay? There's contents pages, great. So what could we do with that? Well, in some cases, the contents pages really lend themselves to being chopped up and mixed around. So before you read the book, maybe you've elicited some ideas from the cover. Maybe then you could get them to think about which order these chapters go in, okay? And they could think about start to think about what's going to happen in the story. Again, you're eliciting the language and some of the themes, okay? And there's no, they won't know the answer to this, so they'd want to read on, and that's an ongoing activity to sort of make sure they, they figure out what's going on until they see the book, and then they can, they can discover it. But anyway, it's a starting activity to get them activated with the language. They can guess uh, what the characters will be about, or they can talk later or during the story about characters. They can recreate conversations. You could chop up these pictures that are in the books. Again, you could take a picture of the book page with your phone, or you could use the digital version, and you could give, I mean, think about it. You know, in a, in a session, we could brainstorm this, but what could you do with all these pictures of the characters during and after the story? Think about that. Uh, you could pause this webinar if you can and write down some ideas that you would do. You could put them on little sticks from the, you know, Starbucks and Costa Coffee. You could get the little sticks that stir your coffee. You could, I would stick these on there and get the students to make their own and create little role plays. Sometimes kids might feel silly doing a role play with each other, so they could do it with the sticks, you know. I would do it with adults, to be honest. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a little child. Um, they could do little text messages. So you could get one student could be Jim Hawkins. The other one could be uh, Billy Bones. And they have to maybe write out or really at home text each other as if they were those characters. Um, I'll look at some other character ideas in a moment. And there's also a handout you can have um, by having registered from this webinar that I'll send you with lots of speaking and writing activities. But the characters, it's part of the whole story, isn't it? Um, we could really mix them up, describe them, compare them. Which one would you be? You know, diaries, blogs. If you had a, a Facebook page and you were uh, Long John Silver, what kind of things would you post? Uh, it goes on, you know. And once you start to take time, you know, to prepare these things, and the students will give you ideas. You could say to them, hey guys, see this picture of all the characters? We could do some activities. Who's got some ideas? And let them be part of the process. Um, here's one which is a bit more uh, standard and a little bit like uh, a course book activity. We, uh, we take the illustrations and um, you choose them, pick them out of the book, um, 
and then pick out some uh, examples from the text that can only come from where that illustration was. This represents the six different chapters, I think, here. So then, you know, this could be a way of getting the students to first encounter the book. You know, maybe you go in with a bit... I probably wouldn't do that. I would probably use a cover or some illustrations on their own. You might show, for example, just the illustrations to the class in a worksheet or on pictures on the wall or the, white, the whiteboard and let them figure out the order in which those pictures will happen in the story. Let them guess the things that are happening, put some ideas of the scenes together, go back to the contents page and wonder which illustration would go in which contents chapter. You can see there's so many variables and here there's a more controlled activity and also getting them used to the language and the, the level of the book and yeah, seeing that there's some exciting things going to happen. And this doesn't happen in course books. Um, course books can be very, very good. I have nothing against them, but they don't really give you this. They can give you this, but it will be in isolation, a pictures, a text, and then the next unit. It's completely different. No, no characters are the same, certainly often in secondary. And even if they are, they know, the students, that this is just going to be about testing. And we're not doing that here. We're, we're just warming them up a little bit. This is about as much testing as I'd give them in a reader, because I want them to be understanding it, learning some new things, but responding to the story because as they respond we know that they've understood it enough because we kept the level low and that has consolidated language repeated the input so there you go you've got all sorts of things there you can uh, you can match up the pictures with the with the pieces of text you can get students to do it you could give the students the pictures and ask them to find pieces of text and they create their own little worksheets for other, for each other so then you've got them being the teachers fantastic Dictation uh, is a good one. Running dictation, as uh, people call it. Running dictation um, is a very popular activity for speaking practice of a controlled nature where you take a text. This comes from the 39 steps. The man was slim with a short brown beard, with a short brown beard and blue eyes. Can I speak to you? He asked. May I come in? He asked. He added. Sorry. And uh, there we want the students to work in groups of three or four they all um, are in the classroom with this text repeated in different parts of the wall. So you, you photocopy this a number of times, the same text, and you stick different copies around the room. None of the copies must be visible to where students are sitting. And then one, they can take turns, but one of the students is the designated uh, dictator. <laughs> teacher and they have to run to the text, the, the closest uh, copy available to them, and look at the, the wall, read the text, remember as much as they can with punctuation, go back and dictate to the others. Now it's a race against time so everyone's doing something and of course it's a great listening activity. The students who have to listen to their, their, their teacher student dictating the text really have to listen. So the pronunciation is important. So again, if you're saying, I want my students to, sp to read out loud because it's good pronunciation, this is better, isn't it? This is more natural and they've got to be more careful. Uh, if they're reading out loud, they just want this whole thing over with. Um, but here they have, to, they have a purpose to be uh, very good at pronouncing the words and punctuation. So when the students, one group puts up their hand and says, teacher, I finished, we finished. And they go, okay, everyone stop, let me check. Mm -hmm. Well, the English is all great, spelling is perfect, but you've missed out some punctuation. <gasps> and now they've got back, and I've, cho I've chosen a text there with uh, deliberate complex punctuation of full stops, uh, inverted commas, and question marks. So that's a really good exercise, very popular, and don't do it all the time, but another way of getting students to be involved with a bit more close attention to the text and to, in this case, language work and speaking. Now here's a picture from, well, have a look. What do you think? Where do you think that might be from? I might, uh, again, this could be a way of getting students talking about a scene, describing language, or maybe I could use this again as a way into a book that we first start reading. Um, if you look closely and you're thinking, is that a man swimming towards the beach from a, sh a shipwreck? You'd be right. And if you said, hmm, is it Gulliver in chapter one? swimming to safety from the storm and sunken ship? Yes! But the kids won't know that, but what they'll guess is a guy swimming, if they 
look closely uh, this is maybe not easy for you to see and you you pull from them what the what has happened present perfect what's going to happen future what's happening at the moment you choose okay so there's language in there but again I want to scaffold what's coming or what's happening so that when they do read they're not going to see this text right and get really overwhelmed and remember what I said about we're not going to overwhelm students anyway I'd like this to be at, at the very worst this is just a lot of text okay uh, not a lot of text that they don't understand this is just a lot of text which they all will understand so even the very confident students will be okay the weaker students will have just a few words they don't know and if that's not the case I would not use this book with them in class um, at all that's why we want readers that you use at or below the students level because this is supporting the difficult texts that you have in your course books and again you could do a little break up there of jigsaw tasks or another one here is you could read this out loud to the students before they see the text so they see the picture here okay and then you've elicited the scene heard some language maybe listening for words or translating from what they're saying to get the words that you know are in this text all right and then as they read it they're even more supported but hey let's not show them the text just yet you could read this text out loud their books are closed they have to listen they can only look at this picture maybe on the screen or a big flash card you've made all right or maybe you've done some sort of handout and they have to listen and as you read listen listen with me okay the journey was comfortable until we met a terrible and then they're listening and they hear you go blank and they go terrible what okay you start again the journey was comfortable we're on a ship at sea guys remember okay until we met a terrible and you do a bit of miming and they whoa uh, wind no rain mm, no storm yes so they're, they're, they're predicting the word the ship was in danger from the strong and you go, yeah wind so you read the text out they can't see it and hey they are with you so you've got some sort of you know connection with the group it's a listening exercise it's slightly vocabulary but I don't want to test words I just want them to know that they can follow the story and join in by filling in the blanks uh, later when you've done this text when they know it and they've talked about it and we're going to do an activity in a moment with film um, or an example of how you can use film for this is go back later and read out mistakes so for example um, if you skip down to the third paragraph when I woke up it was light you could write you could read it out loud and the students have their books closed again okay they can't see the text they're only looking at the picture and you say when I woke up it was dark they go no teacher no no it was light mm -hmm. uh, I decided to get up and look for my mobile phone okay no help I couldn't move my arms no teacher its legs all right again this is just part of your artillery of ideas and activities but not every time or maybe unless they like the activity if they love it keep doing it so that's the way to to get them into the text and um, I really think it's amazing how many teachers are, are very good at using films with their classes now if you want to do Gulliver's Travels um, an example I want to show you here I won't have time to show you the video um, but go to YouTube all right go to Gulliver's Travels I, that's deliberately without the comma um, sorry the apostrophe uh, because that's how somebody spelt it in the search and how they put it on the title the full version of Jack Black playing Gulliver in Gulliver's Travels is there on YouTube okay and uh, what I recommend is you pick a scene there's a scene where he has his own storm at the beginning I forget when 15 minutes in and his boat sinks and he wakes up on the beach and the story begins okay it's very dramatic and really good what I would do there is what happens is a scene and he there's a storm boat sinks he's in the in the water uh, and then next morning he wakes up on the beach and all he's tied up in ropes okay and all these little tiny people are walking over him and if you know the story you'll know why uh, intriguing and very very engaging story and idea to get them going with the with the chapter or just the book to start but let them watch that clip knowing as you do that this film clip is going to be this text which is chapter one when the whole thing starts now what I would do is 
in that exercise or the extract from the, the video is I would ask the group to be uh, in three groups, get the whole class into three groups, and this group would be looking for nouns, okay? just nouns. They're going to watch this, I think it's about two minutes, that scene. They're going to look for nouns. This group looks for verbs or phrasal verbs even, and this, this, this group's going to be looking at maybe just adjectives or feelings or both, okay? Adjectives and feelings, verbs, phrasal verbs, and then nouns here. They can be in any language, all right? I don't care. I just want lots of ideas. I want them focused on the activity. And remember when you use film, um, and if you want ideas on using films, email me at the end of this uh, webinar. My email is there. I have so many resources from the great and good uh, in training circles, and you can find your own using films in ELT, using films in English teaching, loads. But I've got some great ideas and sources there, as I love using film. Short clips, manageable, practical tasks, and here they're focusing on language. Remember, even five or ten seconds into a clip, just pause it and remember to tell the kids, okay guys, what's your job? What are you going to do? Nouns, verbs, adjectives? Because we don't want the students looking at the film and forgetting that they've got work to do. All right. But then we have a brainstorming activity where we go back and think together, what what did you see? What are the words? We put them all down, we get it together, and of course it's all building up to that text. So again, not opening the books and reading cold, jumping in the water like Gulliver, we're going to be supporting it. And of course it's very engaging to see it as a film as well. And then, well, then you can get the students to get together in groups, okay? So the verb a verb person, a noun person, and an adjective person, they get together in new groups of three around the class and then they have to, yep, you guessed it, recreate the text. All right? Now that's, that's something you can do quite a lot. I don't think that's always um, a boring activity unless you did it every day, but it's a nice way to sort of open up the class, uh, change them all around a bit, a different dimension to the reading, and uh, there you go. Nice activity. Uh, they can even rewrite it. So that's writing. They can maybe do their own little broadcast, like an audio book on their phones. That's a speaking activity and listening. Um, so uh, films are great, and I'm very happy to help anybody who needs ideas there. Um, oh, there he is. There's Gulliver. You can ask a student or two to write a picture on the board during the reading they've done with you or um, a book that they're reading on their own and they have to present to maybe just their groups or to the class depending on confidence levels or rapport what's happening in the scene or if you're reading the book together ask the students to work in groups to draw a scene they remember and then the other students with them have to guess what's happening and then they describe it um, do you like my little people there on the island that's quite cute I always liked drawing palm trees when I was a kid <laughs> Um, of course, you know, stories take place uh, in, uh, in, in geographical locations and in time. And so there's so many ways to get the students to work with the themes and topics. So you've got projects, presentation possibilities there, little, little presentations or little mini PowerPoints they could make on the things that are connected with the book, the themes here, we've got lost treasures, real lost treasure, real sunken ships, including the Titanic. Um, and that's where we can go out the story and realize this is not an isolated story just to teach and learn English. I mean, think of the world of fiction. It's all been written to do something which isn't teaching English. Books were written to express ideas, uh, make us think, teach us new things, cultures and uh, dilemmas. That's what fiction uh, is about, and that's really why these books exist. And we want the students to really understand that and not think that Gulliver's Travels was something we did because we learned English. No, that's, that's not what we want. We want them to respond to the themes and the characters, the narratives, uh, how it makes them feel, what they would do differently. Could they rewrite the ending of the book? What would they prefer um, if they were a particular character? And here, a chance to really investigate the theme more thoroughly and perfect you know it could it could line up or should line up with the course book topics that you're doing so when you're thinking about the readers you do together in the class even one reader per week if it's short and simple great get through as many books as you can and let those topics in the titles 
perhaps touch on the, the topics you know are coming through the year. So it takes some preparation, but the, the lasting effect on motivation, language acquisition, and, um, and, and learning and feeling good about English are, are enormous benefits. Ah yes, in the 39 Steps uh, it talks about films of people on the run. It's a great, great story idea, isn't it? Um, it also talks about the First World War because the book talks about some espionage going on that's trying to prevent the First World War. Um, obviously it doesn't work, but that's the story. And it's set, uh, well, when that guy's on the run, and you remember the guy in the field when he got off the train, that's in Scotland. So. Um, whilst he's hiding in Scotland, the early readers pick out Scotland and do something there. Um, so the early readers will always have topics and cultural background magazine style pages to go into the story to make it more interesting and also to flesh out the possibilities in the class, project ideas, content and language integrated learning like CLIL. By the way, whilst we're on the subject of Scotland, do take a look at this book that Ellie did, uh, Scotland is Magic. I live in Scotland, okay? I've been here 20 years and I'm English, so if you're wondering why I don't sound Scottish, it's because I moved here before um, my accent was developed, <laughs> okay? Let me tell you this. I have read loads of books on British life, graded reading, okay? Especially, especially Scotland. This book knows what it's doing. Somebody here, I don't know the author yet, I want to meet her, Sylvana Sardi. This woman who wrote the book, she knows Scotland because this isn't just, yeah, it's got a Highland cow and Glasgow and a, a castle. The writing and the ideas and the topics about Scotland in this book shows that they really understand modern Scotland, not just the stereotypical things, but what's really available to people when they visit. And I've got Glasgow in there and everyone goes to Edinburgh all right and that's okay but Glasgow is great and the book will tell you why plus other things to eat that nobody thinks of beyond haggis great book love it <laughs> um, there's other books actually that um, have come out of the um, Ellie catalogue recently which is a, an award-winning some of them are award-winning titles in a series called Real Lives and these are real kids in real countries uh, and their cultures talking about their lives, their daily routines, the th life at school or at home, families, friends, hobbies, sports, I mean everything you'd imagine uh, would be the sort of things we teach in course books that are important, you know, talking about your own life and the, the life you have around you, the world you're in and the world around you. Now it's made real with real kids and they're really sweet stories around the topics as well, designed like magazines as well. So nice change from fiction if you want that or if somebody prefers to read non-fiction instead of you know a story that's fine I do that um, and lots of opportunities there to talk about culture uh, to talk about festivals to talk about wow Yosh you know this guy in Canada they they don't wear a uniform or we have to wear a uniform or the uh, the the young woman in Uganda wow look at their uniform look what they have for lunch like Japan so yeah all those topics and all those language areas that we we bring into the classroom you can do through non-fiction as well they're a great source of content for quizzes of course i mean the kids love quiz quizzes and the teenagers that their kids too yeah, everyone likes a quiz they can write their own you can write them uh, you can go online use things like quizlet um, get to know it they're really easy to use you could be using that already or things like kahoot i think probably the most popular one is kahoot creating very simple and fun engaging and you know practically linguistically helpful quizzes around the content or the story so that's a great way to take the non-fiction elements of, of these readers at Ellie and the non-fiction titles create create uh, quizzes too um, I'm going to move into some younger learners things now similar you know ideas and parallel activities to the ones we showed earlier in case you teach younger students the same thing look at this cover you know look what's going on there to show the kids maybe you could show just the picture of the young girl here with her light and this discovery she's made and leave the title off just cut off the title or hide it if you're showing the book put some paper and hide it and let them tell you what they think the story is going to be about what can they see why has she got a light where could she be that's dark what is it she's found What's it sitting in? I mean, brilliant, brilliant cover. Um, 
the illustrations are always you know so powerful in lots of ways to teach English or you could show the very first picture in that book um, because look at that in the top left by the globe whenever I show this to students and teachers nobody knows what that is they all think it's a pizza and if you think it's a pizza I think you you'd be you'd be right to think it is but it's not it is of course a dinosaur egg and if I hide the cover first and only show this it gets the kids really excited what what is it it's a, it's a pizza no it's not a pizza <gasps> really it's an egg it's an egg somebody will say it's an egg and then you say well what kind of egg is it a normal egg mm, no so they're curious we you know get them to be wanting to read that next part to find out why she is what she's found what it could be what she's going to do with it where is she another, another activity I could do here is to say to the kids right look at this picture for 30 seconds and then I'm going to hide it I'm going to turn off the screen or turn the picture away what can they remember and I put them into groups for a minute or two what do they remember and they'll remember you know the yellow top the heart design maybe a hair maybe the the globe maybe they'll think of that pizza but it's not a pizza it's an egg the cactus perhaps great using the illustrations as a memory prompt because then you can start to use that to pull out the very language that's going to come in the chapter and then you can say look what's going to happen next guys what do you think she'll do and you don't know but again it's it's about attracting their attention isn't it uh, well this is what she does next and they go oh, really Ooh, what's that mm. so then now let's quickly go through the pictures now I, I won't have time but think of the possibilities of engaging the students and what the activities could be here because now we're doing simple narrative then next suddenly hmm after a while it's a good storytelling linking words perhaps um, now, yeah, what happens then? You're going to elicit the word hatch. Okay, look at that cute little dinosaur and his big little eyes. Big little eyes. Cute. Give him a name. Well, we'll find out the name in the story. So, we're using the pictures to pull them through. You could do this in the first lesson, all right, or you could put all the pictures on a little handout and they've got to rearrange them and figure out the order of the stories. Or you could, every time you do the chapter, the next chapter of the book, go into the next picture and say what's happening next and of course in this story they're afraid because they're thinking here the thinking bubbles they're afraid that the dinosaur is going to be held captive and become this target of the paparazzi and the media and well then you elicit from the students well what do you think is that a good thing do we want them to analyze this dinosaur no you know what are we going to do let's do some critical thinking problem solving come on kids what are we going to do here so they okay I'm gonna tell you the story they go on the internet all right and figure out a place to hide the dinosaur to give him some safety a new home and I like this picture because it shows kids collaborating and that's something that your kids could do to figure out from the illustration writing perhaps what they think will happen next what could the dialogue be here maybe anticipating the the dialogue you're gonna see in the text or maybe they've read the text and now they can try to remember that by retelling that scene by looking at pictures using the pictures as prompts is so powerful and then they go on their journey yeah and you could say they go on the journey there you go what could they take what do you think hmm what can I take on a sailing trip to an island if I have a dinosaur <laughs> what could we feed the dinosaur that's another one what food does a dinosaur eat what can we get here rice cabbage melon obviously whatever you like but that's in the story and they go on a journey and they meet yes they meet a castaway a man all alone in need of a friend oh, and they leave him with a new friend the dinosaur and the dinosaur is safe okay and that's really really sweet and there's only so many pictures there you go through the book pick them out and maybe get the students to predict or you tell them the story maybe the the level or age of the group is so low that you just want to tell the story so rewrite the story the simple lines and read them or put those simple manageable low-level lines that you've written for each picture and stick them in a jumble on the wall or in a handout and let the students tell you okay so these are the activities nothing really too difficult just to get them to connect with the theme to know what's going on and practice their English the way that you want and yeah ideally match it up with what's going on in the course book as I mentioned you could take the pictures there and jumble them up in the wrong order 
give them numbers or letters, let the students work together in one session to figure out the meaning, uh, what's going on in the pictures, what's the right order. They can't know the answer, so they've got to read with you to maybe keep working on that order as they go. And then later, when they know the answers, there you go, that's the right order, that's the wrong order. <laughs> and then they can retell the story the way that they remember, or the prompts, or tell the story you know, on their phones, like a mobile phone audio book, or maybe writing out the story. Okay, or maybe each group, maybe there's nine groups here, and each one has to write their own little caption for the scene or text, and then as a group they can read out loud, like you say, you know, you want to read out loud? Okay, let this be a manageable and, you know, structured, prepared activity where they're not on the spot cold, they've had some time to prepare, it's like a mini presentation, they're holding their text, and so they feel they've got a guide, you are not just out there on their own, they've got their friends with them presenting their picture in their part of the story. Wow, this could even be like a little play, couldn't it? You could adapt the play, write the scripts, um, imagine the costumes. Ah, great. I think end of year or end of term projects like this are, are worldwide, aren't they? Doing stories for the parents as a play. And, you know, as always, there are activity pages and uh, exercises for language and communication work, of course, and that's great. Uh, but, you know, little little steps, not too much. Don't let them think this is just another course book in disguise. That's not what we want. There's a nice little song there at the end of that story. Let's see if I can play that here. Here we go. I hope you can hear it. A gap fill. Ori and Harry sailed the boat and watched the dolphins in the sea. They told stories under the stars and it mangoes. Oh, mangoes for your tea. Can't beat it. So there's a nice little gap fill with a song and they could learn the song. All right. I've shown you there actually um, a part of the Ellie website which, um, oops, <laughs> uh, is online, uh, leonline.com. And here you can see that when you sign in onto the website for free, uh, there's a student area and a teacher's area, and there are free resources. And as you see in that little clip, uh, the teacher's area has the answer keys for exercises and the audio here, which you can download. Um, that's nice and, nice, and, uh, nice and jolly if you want to sing song. So yeah, plenty of things in the books to give you ready-made exercises or multiple choice to get them to do things that, yeah, I mean, you can't keep away from this all the time. I'm not saying you shouldn't do gap fill, sentence matching, multiple choice, but I think it's actually more meaningful, isn't it, and memorable, and perhaps enjoyable if it's all to do with a story that you're working on. If you look at this in a course book, it's not as exciting, is it? I mean, no matter what you do, no matter how good the text is, the students are thinking, I don't know, this is just another exercise. But if they're part of the story, well, more, more, more motivating, I reckon. So, there you go. Grammar and activities there for vocabulary. Uh, but, like I said, not too much, just a little. And you'll find those pages interspersed. These are pages inside the readers, not separate downloads. Go to the ellegradedreaders.com website. Download that guide for lots of activities and to see how you could use songs and even films, do drama, and get the students really interested in the stories, use their language, uh, and develop their language skills through the stories. Um, other ideas here to finish, oral reports. So they could do those little summaries um, on, for example, those illustrations. They, they pick an illustration, they give a little report on what happened. Maybe it's a sort of recap activity the next day. Or maybe they could talk about their own books that they're reading, their own individual titles, and do little oral reports. Prepare something, maybe four or five lines about what's happened in their story. My story is about Frankenstein. Last night, in the story, Dr. Frankenstein created a monster, and the monster got away. You know, that kind of thing. That's it. Uh, no real you know, marking, big long essays and things. We just want them to show that they're reading, and use the language that works with what you're teaching already presentations we've mentioned, creating scripts. Sometimes you'll see really great dialogue in the reader and think, hmm, I, why don't we get the, the class to work in groups and recreate that 
word for word, nothing wrong, don't change it, unless you want them to maybe change the dialogue, that works. What would it be like if it was a different dialogue? What, what would happen if the monster turned out to be really nice? What would he say in that scene instead of being horrible, okay, or angry? Um, or they can just simply take the, the, the actual written um, script that's inside the text, take out all the description, but just add some direction. You know, if the monster was waving his arms, you know, then don't read that out. Let that be a little stage direction. So now they're creating a little bit of drama for the classroom. Character hot seat is when one of the characters, let's say Frankenstein again, Dr. Frankenstein, is in the hot seat. That student who knows the story and you're doing it together, you've done a lot of the themes around it. Now at the end of the story, you've got students maybe in groups of four and one of them is on the hot seat and they all have to answer uh, the questions from the other uh, students in the group who are maybe journalists or you know whatever they're they're interviewing why why did you make a monster how did you feel when the monster came back and blamed you <laughs> and or maybe you're the monster and you you've got great language skills and then you're saying hey monster why are you so angry well i wasn't so sure i wanted to be created um everybody was horrible to me and you've got ideas there for empathizing no never mind monster we'll be your friend <laughs> So, you know, hot seats are great. Students can get involved. And maybe the best one, or they want to show you what they did. Or maybe they could really rehearse and prepare the whole thing. You know, prepare three questions, three answers, and then you've got a more structured uh, communication activity from writing. Like I said in one uh, activity earlier, they could do instant messages as if they're the characters. Or describe a typical day. Or if, um, let's say, uh, the Gulliver's Travels. Let's imagine he could write a blog. I don't know where he'd find a computer, but he's got a computer in, in my world, and he writes a blog. You know, day one, arrived at the island, and I was in ropes, and these little people are crazy. They're going to kill me. I hope I'm okay. Um, and where is the Wi-Fi? <laughs> um, gifts and trash. I love this. Now, I read this. These aren't my ideas. I've used them, but they're very common ideas. If you gave a gift to one of the characters in your story or the story we're doing, what would it be? Let's say Jekyll and Hyde, and if you gave a gift to Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde, what would they be? Or if you looked in, in Dr. Jekyll's trash, in his rubbish, late one night, what would you find in there? That was a great activity somebody shared with me. Or a news report, you know, they create a little set and they could do as if they're newsreaders, you know. And today, a doctor created a monster out of his own alter ego. Police are searching for a very dangerous man in the shadows. <laughs> that kind of thing. Brilliant. Uh, if you look up activities for using graded readers, these sorts of things are out there or in the, uh, the ellegradedreaders.com um, website guide. You can, you can download the guide as a PDF and start to really look at these ideas for yourself in your books. Finally, if you drop me a line, andy at eltconnections.com. Uh, I work as a consultant uh, and trainer with Ellie Publishing and absolutely love helping teachers to get into readers more. I've done some worksheets here on speaking activities. I've also done one on writing activities. Just let me know what you want. And also a little page there on what I was saying at the beginning on why reading has gone wrong a little bit, how we can put that right, and really how graded readers really are a missing piece in most curriculum designs, but actually they're incredibly effective and powerful. Um, you'd think that by pushing the students harder every time that they will eventually get it, but they don't. And the graded reading uh, schemes that people use are like language assistants, giving them that regular practice of input that they understand uh, with enormous uh, effects on their motivation, their confidence, and their feeling for language, which is what we want, and a feeling for reading. So thank you very much for taking part, and listening and watching here on this webinar on activities to develop language and skills with graded readers. If you have any questions and feedback or need the things I mentioned, drop me a line. I always reply or get in touch with your team in your local area from Ellie International at ellieonline.com. See you next time.